DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. It's the genetic material that's in the cells of all living organisms. It's the double-stranded helix structure in cell nuclei that carries the genetic information of an organism. It consists of thousands of genes that are made up of millions and billions of pairs of nucleotides. Each gene is a set of instructions on how to build a protein molecule. But in order to make a protein from DNA, there's another player, messenger RNA. DNA is copied into mRNA, RNA, ribonucleic acid, a single-stranded sort of mirror image temporary version of DNA. This mRNA transfers the DNA message from the nucleus to the ribosomes, where the proteins are manufactured. The mRNA is then translated into proteins. And in turn, these proteins do things. They are the workhorses for cellular and organism function. Taken together, DNA, RNA, and proteins are the blueprints and raw materials for life. Knowing that these molecules exist in living organisms and how they work gives humans some powerful tools for manipulating the genetics of organisms. Well, this brings up another molecule involved. It's a version of RNA, that temporary copy of the DNA, called RNAi. The I in RNAi stands for interference. When a cell wants to stop making a protein, it produces a little RNAi molecule which silences certain DNA from producing a protein. RNAi is a naturally occurring, necessary genetic component of all organisms, including humans. For example, RNAi has the important job of fighting things like viruses and regulating genetic changes and mutations. RNAi does this by specifically targeting certain sequences of DNA and blocking the production of proteins. Since the discovery of the RNAi process in the 1990s, this genetic mechanism has led to some pretty innovative applications. Application of RNAi has shown to be a promising method of improving life for us on many levels, including switching off genes that cause diseases, learning what genes do and how they work, and making food production easier. Researchers use RNAi by designing and introducing short strands of RNA, around 21 to 25 nucleotides, these short strands bind to the complementary sequences in the genetic code. RNAi works by stopping the information in the DNA from getting to the protein-making ribosomes. It interferes with the messenger RNA. When it comes to agricultural applications, RNAi can be used as a form of genetic pesticide that can be built right into a plant's biology. For example, an insect pest feeds on a crop that deploys RNAi coded to stop the ability for that pest to digest food and process nutrients from the plant. As a result, the pest's growth or its ability to reproduce is slowed or halted, or the pest dies. Or a crop produces RNAi that changes a plant's chemistry, making that plant unattractive to a pest. Or the RNAi can block a plant's susceptibility to an herbicide, allowing the herbicide to only kill weeds on the farm. When we consider how society relies on crops for food, fuel, and fiber, it's easy to see why RNAi can be a valuable asset in crop improvement and a powerful tool against yield loss. However, just as when using other powerful tools, we have to make sure that the technology is safe. Keep in mind that genes are made up of millions and billions of pairs of nucleotides and RNAi targets gene sequences around 21 to 25 nucleotides long. That's right, 21 nucleotides in a sequence out of billions in a gene. With those kinds of odds, the chances of the RNAi blocking other RNAs from producing totally unpredicted proteins is likely. One possible risk is that the RNAi molecule might silence the correct gene, but in the wrong organism. It turns out that the RNAi and the RNA don't have to be 100% identical for there to be silencing. For example, in addition to silencing part of a corn pest digestive system, maybe an RNAi molecule would accidentally silence part of the digestive system of a lady beetle, or a honeybee, or a cow, or cousin Mabel. These risks are not trivial especially because they're different from those posed by most other types of pesticides that we're used to dealing with. Now, considering the unintentional turning off of unintended genetic functions of targeted and non-targeted organisms, and the huge complexity of biological and ecological systems on which all life depends, this could be a bit of a problem. 
Without more knowledge about how pesticidal RNAi works in pests and non-target organisms, it's difficult to predict how this technology might affect the environment. Sounds dire, right? Well, it doesn't have to be. To manage these risks, we can already take some unknowns out of the equation to make sure that the pesticidal RNAi poses minimal threats to the species that we want to stick around. When you want to eliminate the unknown, what do you need? More data. You have to take steps to weed out RNAi that silences genes other than the one you mean to target. And be sure the genes they target are really involved in the cellular function of interest. So assessing an area's bio-inventory can help. Then we'll know what species might be exposed to RNAi. Also, we'll get the genomes, or genetic blueprint, for the exposed species, and screen potential RNAi molecules to see whether a particular pesticide might hurt the species we want to keep healthy. From this, we can develop comprehensive risk assessment procedures that can make sure our desire to manage pests isn't coming at the expense of Mother Nature. Science can help us to understand the benefits and risks associated with this amazing new technology called RNAi and where it fits in with a sustainable and long-term successful plan for agriculture. For more information on RNAi-based insecticides, refer to articles published in Bioscience Magazine and online at igrow.org.